Good morning, church. This is a wonderful day and a great place for all of God's children to gather together and worship the creator of all things. Amen? Amen. I'd, like, I'd like to invite you to stand as you are able as we go to God in worship and in song.
First United Methodist Church of Maumel. I'm Aubrietta Jones, and I uh, bid you welcome to a great day to worship the Lord. Welcome to those who are online as well as those who are here in the room. I want to share with you something you may not have realized. The first case of COVID-19 was diagnosed in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, March 11th, 2020. That means this is just a couple days past the, uh, the two-year anniversary of the beginning of COVID-19 in Arkansas. And I was reflecting on this and thinking about all the ways that the world has changed 
and all the ways we have grown. Um, the, uh, there, there's certainly been loss of life. There's been a lot of sad things that have happened. But our church has done amazing things to get through this time. And there are ministries that we have added that have strengthened us. There are ministries that we've added that, has increased, that have increased our reach of love into our community. And in some very good ways, we will never be the same. We started our camera ministry, and our friends who are with us online and will be with us online throughout the week as they watch this, uh, we would not have had this ministry as soon uh, because uh, we were, we were uh, pressed on to do this by COVID-19. Uh, we uh, found out, I remember, late one Wednesday night in those early days of COVID-19 that on Thursday morning they were not going to be able to provide uh, free lunches for uh, parents to pick up at the, for the public school kids because there had been a confirmed COVID-19 case. And our backpack ministry has exploded uh, as a result of that urgent and sudden need in our community. Uh, so much good has been done in the face of these hardships. I want to invite you just to take a moment and to reflect on your own life. We, we tend to think about the things that we've lost, but I want you to take just a moment of silence and reflect on the ways that you have grown and changed and overcome the good things that have happened in your life during this very difficult two years. Just take a moment. Thanks be to God for his faithfulness and his love toward us. Beloved, it's time to begin our morning offering, and I want to let you know that there are attendance slips attached to your bulletin. Please complete those. If, you, if we have all your information, you might just want to put your first and last name, and you can drop those in when the ushers come around to collect the morning offering. Uh, you can also put your morning offering there, or you can give online, and the giving information is on the screen. And uh, there's, just, there's a lot of good we get to do together. As I just highlighted through our COVID-19 uh, commemoration, there's also day school starting. We get to be a Christian influence in the lives of uh, the children as we look toward fall registration and we look toward the summer programs. And uh, as we're meeting here, many of our United Methodist men are on a uh, retreat and we're praying for those men. We get to do so much good together and I thank you for being a part of the church and supporting it with your giving. This is a great church. Um, and this is a church that loves one another and cares for one another. And one way that we can do that is we can do that through prayer. So I would like to invite you to go with me to God in prayer together. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we thank you this day for all of the blessings you have handed down to us. Uh, God, we thank you for this church and our brothers and sisters in Christ that love and care for one another as one body. Lord, our hearts continue to hurt for our neighbors in the Ukraine region. We've seen hate and violence and death, and Lord, we can't bear to see it any longer. Today, we say a prayer for peace, and that hearts would be softened, and that an end would come to this conflict. Lord, we also reflect on the blessings you have given us and we give thanks sometimes God we may ask for things we don't need or at times when we don't need them and God I am grateful that you who is far wiser than I gives me what I should have when I should have it please give us the patience to wait upon your gifts so that we may witness the magnitude of your grace in our lives. In the holy and precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
invite the children to come forward and meet me in front of the altar for the children's lesson. Come on up and uh, as they're coming, go ahead and have a seat. I'm going to read scripture here in just a moment and then we're going to have a little talk. Okay? 
So everybody have a seat. Good to see you guys here today. Uh, The scripture today is Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 49, and this is what Jesus says. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, that means does them, I will show what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and he laid a foundation on rock. And when the flood came, the torrent struck the house but couldn't shake it because it was well built. The one who hears my words but does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed and the destruction was complete. All right, friends, what do I have in my hand? Popcorn. Popcorn, a bag of popcorn. How many of you love popcorn? Raise your hands. Lots of people like popcorn. So I like popcorn, but you know, I'm kind of in a hurry today, and you know you're supposed to put the bag in the microwave. The instructions are right on the back. I just don't feel like doing that, so I'm just going to eat it straight out of the bag. How does that sound? You guys want to eat? This is what's inside the bag of popcorn. And church family, if you try this at home, you may never eat popcorn again because this stuff looks disgusting, right? Does anybody think that looks good? I see a few mischievous faces who wanted to say yes, and they had to back out. They just couldn't do it because it looks so bad. Um, It's all hardened and orange. And you know what? The other thing, too, is that popcorn kernels are hard enough that they probably would make you really sick if you tried to do that. You might even break a tooth. Don't try to do it at home because it'd be really bad for you. This is not yummy because I didn't follow the instructions. The instructions are right on the bag. The directions tell me what I'm supposed to do. You know... Sometimes in life, there are things that we want to do faster than we should. Sometimes in life, there's times that we don't want to follow instructions because we want to do something different and the instructions don't sound fun. Do you think instructions are important? Yes, yes. Jesus gives us instructions for our lives. He tells us about being kind to people, even when they're kind of mean to us. And sometimes when somebody's mean to us, We want to do our own thing, and we want to be mean right back, don't we? I mean, we do, but Jesus wants us to be kind to people even when they're mean to us. Uh, Jesus wants us to be generous to people even when maybe there's things we really want for ourselves. Sometimes he says, you know, you got to remember the poor and so forth, and so you want to give and make it possible for them to eat and to live. Jesus gives us so many great instructions, and the Bible passage I just read is about how much that Jesus wants us to do what he says. Because when we do what he says, things turn out better and our lives are better, even if it's a little harder at first because we're trying to do the right thing when we want to do the wrong thing. In the long run, it's much better. Kind of like if I had cooked the popcorn. Okay? Uh, Let's go to God in prayer, and I want you to just repeat after me, okay? Dear God, thank you for instructions on how we should live. Help us to obey Jesus. In Jesus' name, name. and in the Holy Spirit, Spirit. amen. Amen. All right, guys, go ahead and get your activity bags. And um, enjoy. Okay, get yeah, one of them might be lacking one. Just go ahead and get another one. There you go. Good job, guys. Thanks so much. All right, as they're returning to their seats, I'm going to share a memory with you. And it's complicated. I was really little. I'm not sure how accurate my memory is. It may be that I'm remembering this wrongly because of how many, uh, how many uh, episodes and how many things I saw on the nightly news. But I grew up in southwest Missouri in Springfield, and it was an easy and fast vacation for us to go to Kansas City. And I remember I was like five years old when this hotel went up in Kansas City. And I'm 99% sure that this memory is real, that I walked around that hotel. And I got to see in that hotel these amazing walkways. They were overhead. And it's as if they were floating in midair. They were huge. They spanned the room. And it was so impressive. It was maybe one of the most impressive hotels I had ever been in up to that point. And um, it just, it, it amazed, it was, they were called sky bridges. And it wasn't long 
after the construction of that hotel, that that hotel was on the news because it turned out that those sky bridges that looked like they floated in midair sort of did float in midair. And the sky bridge on the fourth floor collapsed during a party onto the sky bridge on the second floor, and the whole thing went down. And the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Kansas City became a place where 114 people lost their lives. It was, with the exception of 9-11, still is the greatest structural collapse disaster in 130 years. And what a painful lesson to learn about preparation and about self-discipline and about saying no to the temptation to make something that is fast, uh, that, it, that goes up fast and is really impressive without a great foundation. There was so much pressure on the people who designed that building and the people who were constructing it, all the engineers involved, so much pressure to get done on, in budget and to get done on time. And it was so important to be impressive. It was the 80s. Do you remember when we honestly thought a power tie would help you to win in a meeting? Without preparation and anything else, looks mattered. And in that building, looks ended up ruling the day and appearances ruled the day and it cost hundreds and hundreds of people dearly as they lost loved ones in that disaster. The passage that we read today from the Gospel of Luke is about a man who built a house in a sure and certain way on solid foundation, and he's compared to one who builds a house without a foundation underneath. Now, back then, uh, there were not building codes for houses that were strictly enforced in ancient Greece. If that's something that interests you at all, you'll know they didn't have a lot of building codes back then. So you just had to use your own prudence um, for a personal residence. And I imagine two men in that situation at that time building houses. Uh, I imagine their families looking on. I imagine that the one that dug down deep and built the real foundation, how much more expensive that was for him, uh, how that he would have to hire others to help him, uh, how that his family might have to live with his parents while he's getting that house built, or maybe they were living in tents and sometimes that wasn't a comfortable living situation. I imagine the pressure to get that finished and how uncomfortable that waiting must have been. And I imagine someone else building a house very quickly and maybe even looking down on their neighbor whose life was uh, more challenging because they were trying to do it right. This is all going in my imagination and the reason I'm imagining it that way is because I think sometimes that's how life is, isn't it? I mean, sometimes people are doing the hard thing that is the right thing, and to the world around, that action does not seem that impressive because their choices seem to make their lives more tedious. It seems like that they are suffering more because of the commitment to do the right thing. It seems like they're missing out, maybe, in this age when people are encouraged to follow their bliss and do whatever feels right in the moment. And yet, in the long run, the one who commits to what is right instead of what is easy is pleasing their Father in heaven. And there is a sure and certain reward. The, the confidence of knowing that a life has been lived with integrity and the awareness that somehow those actions of obedience build up the kingdom of heaven and glorify God, the God who loves us, the God who designed this world, the God who knows how everything is supposed to work. You know, if, if you think about the concept of obedience, that is not a word that is associated with many things that we admire today. Obedience is not directly associated with the concept of leadership. Obedience, in our thinking anyway, is not directly associated with the concept of heroism. Obedience is not directly associated in our minds and in our culture with the concept of strength. 
And yet, if you think about it, any time a military victory is won that is important, there are hundreds of people that are being obedient to the, uh, to the orders that they have received from a supervisor, from somebody else who is a higher up in the military. And any time that uh, somebody achieves a, a great goal, it is because that they have self-disciplined themselves to a standard that they have been obedient to. When you watch the Olympics and somebody wins a medal, it is because of years of years of obedience to training principles. And people who are in leadership have laws they must obey. They have lived in the obedient tutelage, uh, the obedient service of others who have tutored them and helped them get to where they are. And without that, they would never have achieved. Obedience is important, and it takes a lot of strength and a lot of self-discipline. When we think about Jesus Christ, we think about his love and his compassion and his forgiveness, and we don't often think about that he had to be obedient to a plan. The plan to save the world through his own death. We think about his godliness and his godness because he is God in the flesh. And we don't always think about the fact that dying on the cross was not something he wholeheartedly wanted to do. I mean, he wanted to do this for us. He wanted to give his life to atone for our sins, to make us part of God's eternal family. But it was also something that was in conflict with his human nature. So that when he was praying the night that he knew he was going to be arrested, he, he went to God and he said, your will be done. Not just mine, because he wanted there to be another way, but he was obedient. He was obedient. It is one thing to call Jesus Lord and to rest in his grace and to know that we're forgiven for every sin. And truly, even after we acknowledge him as our Lord and our Savior, and, and even when we're striving to do the right thing, we know we will sin and we will still give in to temptation sometimes. And we need that grace our entire lives long. But Jesus didn't actually die so that we could be mired in sin. Because really, the sinful lifestyle is a lifestyle that robs us of a lot of joy, that robs us of meaning and beauty in our lives that sometimes this side of heaven we don't fully see and appreciate. Jesus died to free us from our sin. Jesus died to help us overcome. And the example of obedience that Jesus sets before us is an example that is meant to melt our hearts and make us wish to be more obedient to him. How do we live lives of obedience? How do we accept Jesus not just as the Savior that forgives us of our sin, but the Lord who calls the shots in our lives each and every day? How do we do that? It takes a tremendous amount of strength. And it really takes the strength of the Holy Spirit working in and through our lives. It takes the faithful witness of Christian community to help us along. That Hyatt Regency tragedy that I told you about a few moments ago, uh, I was curious. I decided to look up the, uh, the future of the lives of some of the people that worked in that disaster. And the head engineer on that project... Uh, became someone who, uh, who tours the country and talks to people about uh, terrible disasters in construction. I think he's retired now, but that's what he ended up giving his life to. He told people what the decisions that they had made did and how that lack of communication and the desire to rush through cost everyone so dearly. That's what he ended up doing with his life. His life became about helping others not to do the same terrible things. And when we who follow Jesus Christ decide to live our lives 
with that kind of obedience and discipline that Jesus is describing in this passage, when we decide to dig down deep and try to build our actions on a firm foundation of wanting to please the Lord, whether we know it or not, we are engaging in that same kind of testimony because the world is watching. The world is watching, and the world sees what we do with our lives. People that are younger than us see, people that are our co-workers and colleagues see, they see what we do with our lives. And those little decisions that we make every day to try to please the Lord, they have eternal significance. Beloved, it is up to each one of us to sift through our hearts and minds, to sift through our days, to look at our lives each and every day and say, God, where did I win by being obedient to you this day? And where is it that I need more work? Where do I need to be more patient? Where do I need to be more loving? Where do I need to exhibit more of the fruits of the Spirit that we talked about in the previous week in this series? Where am I falling short? We need to bring this up to God, not because God doesn't know, but because we need to know, and we need Him to show us our lives. Sometimes in our lives we do things, we take things on, and we don't even realize what the true foundation of our actions have become. We don't even realize that there is vengefulness in our hearts. We don't even always know that there's jealousy that motivates our actions. We don't always know that there is selfishness underneath. We need God to go with us to examine our hearts. As a master inspector of a building would be able to look and see and judge the firmness of a foundation. We need God to reveal these things to us. You know, the thing about building a building is that once you've built it, it might look beautiful until disaster hits because that foundation is covered. But the Lord sees the things that are hidden. The Lord sees the things that are hidden in our hearts. The Lord sees the things that are hidden in our minds. And God can hold up to our souls a mirror that helps us to judge and see rightly. Beloved, we are frail and our judgment is not perfect. There are so many voices in our culture today that that really urge us to trust our inner knowing about what's going on with our own actions and thoughts and trust our own opinions above anyone else's and above anything else. That's, That's how we're encouraged to live today. It's just the culture we live in. Part of being a disciple of Jesus Christ is being able to pray that prayer that Jesus prayed the night that he was betrayed as he knelt before God and said, not my will, but your will be done. Part of being a disciple is being that obedient and having that understanding of how little we understand and how little we know. Our own reasoning will not get us where God wants to get us in life. Our own reasoning is not going to get us the blessings God wants for us. The sacrificial love that people show in the difficult times in a relationship, it's not glamorous, but it's good. The desire to do what is just in the workplace when what is expedient would bring more money and save time. To the world, it is not glamorous, but it is good. The choice each and every day to do our dead-level best to tell the truth and to live authentic lives when a great display of bravado might be appealing to someone in our lives, It, it, it might not feel like the path that's going to get us where we want to be, but it is good. There are thousands of things that Jesus invites us to do in our, in our lives. There are many ways that Jesus invites us to live a life of truth and beauty and honesty and service to those around us, and all of them are good, and very few of them will get us public accolades. But our call is to be like the man who builds his house on the rock 
on the firm foundation. And the firm foundation are the teachings of Jesus Christ and his witness of love and grace and self-sacrifice for all of us. Our salvation is founded on that. What happens to us when we die is founded on that. And God's greatest hope for us is that what happens when we live will also be founded on that. Thanks be to God for the gift of Jesus, this humble witness of love. Thanks be to God for his wisdom and grace. Thanks be to God for the call to be faithful. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand as we can and worship in a song.
live for you with our hands Beloved in Christ, go forth to love and serve God and your neighbor in all that you do. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Amen.